Conversations that create more conversations. Arrow.net. A-R-R-O-E dot net. We are unplugged and totally uncut with Howard Bryant. Aren't you amazed at how people from all over this nation, any generation, you talk about baseball and everybody has a story, they have a passion, they have a drive, and they want to learn more. Yeah, it's true. It's it's such a special sport in so many ways. And people always ask me, why is baseball you know different from the other sports why do we always pull baseball away from the other games and and i think the reason is is that baseball always pulls you back to your family yep baseball is always it's a father son game it's a it's a mother daughter game it's a mother son it's a family game and it every time whenever you listen to people talk about their baseball recollections it always comes back to their previous generations it always comes back to family and i think that especially and I, and I think there are plenty of reasons for that and one of the reasons is that it's the only game in town during the summer school is out <laughs> there's not you know there's there's no other sports competing with it no other live sports competing with it and you just go through the summer whether you're sitting there on the radio you're listening to it on the radio while you're you know outside or whatever and it's just it stays with you and because the game stays with you the players stay with you yeah yeah. And Ricky is one of those players that transcends generations. He crosses three generations in the sport. And people always have something that they want to say about him. What I wanted to do in this book more than anything else was to really follow his story arc. It's a very American story to me. Someone who started out with an unbelievable amount of just talent and really wasn't very popular when he first hit the scene as a rookie in 1979 through the 80s not the most popular player and then we begin to soften because that's what we do in this country we begin to reappraise people and now we're looking at ricky with a with a tinge of nostalgia mm -hmm. that he's this satchel page slash yogi Berra character that we can't keep our <laughs> eyes off of he's a different guy now and i wanted to explore that arc i wanted to explore how that happened and in, in a very uniquely american way so true because i'll tell you what there are many times cause first of all ricky henderson was when i grew up he was my superman because my mother and i would sit there in front of those oakland a games and just just watch them and watch them and watch them because i wanted to see ricky play i wanted to see him fly and and it's in my eyes as a child he could fly Absolutely. I mean, he could do anything he wanted on a baseball diamond. And I yeah. think one of the things that I really enjoyed most about Ricky was those moments, especially 89. 89 is, 89 is his masterpiece. And you have, to, you have to just think about where he was at that time. Here's a player who signed a big contract to be a superstar with the Yankees. And when you join the Yankees, you are expected to do one thing, and that's win the World Series. <laughs> right. Because that's what they do over there. And yet his team, with all the superstar names, got punched in the face not once but twice. Mm. Once because they didn't win, because despite having Don Mattingly and Ron Guidry and Don Baylor and, and Ricky and Winfield, they never made the playoffs. And then the second thing to make it even worse was that the Mets were good. <laughs> and so <laughs> this was happening at the same time. So you've got George Steinbrenner and the, and the Mets fighting over the back page. And Ricky's teams aren't winning. Yeah, He's putting up big numbers, but they're not winning. And so what was really important to Ricky by the time 1989, when he gets traded back to Oakland, now he's got a rap and he's got that reputation. He's one of those guys who puts up big numbers, but yeah, but you can't win with him. And there's always an asterisk to Ricky. Mm -hmm. And that's why his 1989 postseason, where the A's beat Toronto in the ALCS and then beat the Giants in the World Series, that's why this period from 89 to 91 is some of the greatest baseball we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Ricky had to prove to everyone that he was not just a compiler. He was a championship-level ball player, a winning ball player. And it was that time period where everything changed. Did it hurt your feelings when George Steinbrenner would say that he was milking his injuries? I mean, I'm a martial artist. I know what it's like to have those deep inside your body injuries. And there are times that I, I had to sit out of different tournaments and stuff like that. But, I mean, to accuse somebody of milking an injury. There's nothing worse. There's nothing worse than that. And I think that because what you're really talking about is, is his professionalism. Mm-hmm. And that is the word that really did stay with Ricky. Was he 
giving you maximum effort? Was he giving you performances? Was he faking injury? Was he trying not to play? Did he not want to, to, to give his best because he was upset about his contract? All of these different things always clouded the Ricky Henderson experience. And I think that what was really, really difficult in watching him play was anybody who's ever had a hamstring injury knows those things are horrible. And they don't go away. They don't go away. And they don't go away. Right. They don't go away. But Ricky didn't get any sympathy. And the reason why Ricky didn't get sympathy, one of the reasons was because you got to remember the time period that you're going through maybe the nastiest period of labor relations in in Mm -hmm. sports history Mm -hmm. during the 1980s. Fans hated the players because the players were making so much money. The players were being undermined by their own ownership because they didn't want to pay them and they thought the players were greedy and the fans went along with that. And while that was happening, the owners were engaged in collusion in the 1980s. They were actively trying to destroy the players. And so Ricky got caught up in that as well because for all the money that was going going out there uh, being paid out to these players... Ricky was completely unabashed and saying, I deserve my share. Whereas back then, custom-wise, you were supposed to be very differential and say, oh, I don't deserve this money and thank you. And Ricky was like, no, 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 I'm worth every penny. And that just drove, <laughs> that just drove people crazy. But see, I like that hot dog type attitude, though. I mean, I love it when a, when, a, when a player is that confident and they can come back and prove it. Well, that's right. It's the it ain't bragging if you can do it type right. of thing. And that's why Ricky is that's why Ricky is such a great generational split, because you have to remember when Ricky came into the league in 1979, you still had Dick Young. You still had Red Smith. You still had all the old newspaper giants who were still writing and they didn't have any time for Ricky. They looked at him as a modern selfish showboat player and they were all in the pockets of the owners as well back then. But the new generation of fans, they loved Ricky. They couldn't take their eyes off of him. He was one of the reasons why you went to the ballpark. But people just couldn't stand him. And I think it's really important to remember during that time period how much tumult was taking place in the game. That it was a nasty, nasty sport. Now, the fans loved it. But, boy, if you go back into the 1980s, man, it was like there was a labor fight every year. We just went through one this year, but there hadn't been one since the Mm mid-90s. But back then, it was like they were fighting over money every single year. Would you say that part of Ricky's mystique, as well as his strength, his his superpower was the fact that he was always curious? I think Ricky's superpower, whether he wanted to have it or not, is what he said to me back in the dugout back in Mesa during spring training, I think in 2018, where he says, I wasn't trying to draw attention to myself. I just had style. <laughs> he, played the g- he just played the game a certain way. There are certain people. You gotta, And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this book. You go back and you think about when you were a kid and think about whose styles you wanted to emulate. And think of, For me, it was Dave Winfield. I wasn't anywhere near 6'7", but I still tried to hit like I was 6'7". I'm like, <laughs> you should be more compact. You're not tall. I just love the Winfield swing, though. I just love the, the way that he played the game. And with Ricky, people wanted to emulate what he could do. You, he was just such an electric, electric player. And then you add to that the personality. And what I always found, what I always find fun about doing books is just going through the day by days and just digging into the history and how, and finding out how different the history was at the time to how we perceive it now. And it's just so much fun to, to dig into and to look at it because Ricky, as a player today, you could make an argument that there's not a whole lot that he does. (laughs) That would offend anyone. They do all that stuff all the time. Or watch a basketball game. Everyone's drawing attention to themselves. But back then, he was really a unique player. And that makes him separate because all of a sudden, you're ahead of your time. Aren't you redefining what a sport journalist is? Because it, it, it's more than just you know magazine stories anymore. We're, if, as, as readers, we demand books just like this one from, from you guys. Yeah, I think that, but that's the challenge. That's what we always want to do. I think that one of, I never got into sports writing to be just a beat writer. Mm -hmm. I always saw it as a training ground to to get the sources, (laughs) to learn the game so you could write bigger stories. And once you got, once you had the sourcing to allow people to talk to you, so they got to know you when it, then soon, soon it would be time for you to tell those bigger stories. 
This well, is why you do it. So then you could actually call Dave Stewart or you could call Ricky yep. or Buck Showalter or call these guys and they'll talk to you one on one and you'll actually get Buck Showalter was one of my all time favorite interviews in this book. He was so much fun because he he loved Ricky and the stories that Buck tells about Ricky in the minor leagues because Buck was playing in the Yankees farm system and Ricky was in the A's farm system in Jersey City in 1978. It just goes back and you realize, oh, these guys have been at it for 45 years. <laughs> it's, it's just so, it was so much, so enjoyable. If you're a baseball fan, to just dig into the old history and to and the new because Ricky crosses these generations. I just had such a such so much fun working one. I, I love the old stories of the farm teams and stuff like that because it was always the scent of the bus or or, or how a dugout. You know, it was never always the cleanest dugout. But it was you know oh, they're, one they're, of my favorites oh. on that too. One of my favorites was the fact that when the A's owner Charlie Finley thought that Mike Norris, the A's pitcher, was getting too big for himself. And had to be taught a lesson, so punitively sent him to the minor leagues. Yeah. <laughs> he said, Mike, Mike told me, Charlie thought I needed to smell some bus fumes. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> would, you, would you say that Ricky, the life and legend of an American original, is, is a modern day baseball card? I mean, it's because you give us so much. I thought that one of the things that I loved about the book was the opportunity to really dig into the history. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's so much in there. And to go back into Oakland and to talk about, I mean, you just, this isn't, this doesn't happen. I mean, I grew up in Boston when one guy made a division two team, everybody was jumping around and had a parade for him. <laughs> but look at the talent that came out of West Oakland, you West and North Oakland. You had Ricky Henderson, Lloyd Mosby, mm -hmm. Dave Stewart, and Gary Pettis all on the same team as 10 year olds <laughs> and be and before that you had bill russell frank robinson you had frank robinson kurt flood and beta pinson in the same high school outfield oh my god i mean you just can't make up this level of talent and then around the corner from mccliman's high school you had the great future boston celtic champion paul silas living with his cousins downstairs and his cousins happen to be the pointer sisters yeah. they all lived in the same neighborhood it's in, it's incredible oh and by the way bill russell lived next door to huey newton who would form the black panthers not wow. too long afterward it's and by the way the newtons and the russells lived next door to each other in louisiana so they are part of the great migration they leave louisiana they they migrate to oakland and then they're neighbors <laughs> man i'll tell you what uh, history books will never write it but the, the, the many times that i stood at my pitch back and struck out ricky henderson man I, that was my goal <laughs> i was i mean that pitch back was my you life and your recognition for that. i do i do <laughs> <laughs> well and that was the other thing too that i felt like it's been such a difficult decade it's been so so difficult in terms of the amount of strife that we've had in the country and the stuff that I have to write about and they're all important subjects but I wanted to write something fun there's a lot of history in here there's a lot of good stuff in here but I, it's really is a baseball book and I wanted to get back to doing that to give people and give myself a reminder of why we love these games and why we love these players and what these players can do and and how they've made us feel and I just felt like it was something that was really um, important to me. Did you get the opportunity to talk with fans in the way of, you know, who who did they follow after Ricky Henderson? I, I went the way of Ken Griffey Jr. That that was my next superstar. Yeah, yeah. I think that it was Griffey. Then the game changed. I mean, yeah. once you start getting into the strike and coming out of the strike, one, Ricky's in his mid-30s, so he's not always an everyday player anymore, and he's changing teams every year, but people still loved Ricky. Then he just goes to Oakland in 1998 as a 39-year-old and leads the league in stolen bases because that never happens, um, and it never happened again. But then, yeah, you start moving into those mid to late 90s. Now it's Bonds and Sosa and McGuire, and you start yeah. moving into essentially the steroid era. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the considerations for this book as well. I wanted to write a book for once that I felt could be fun. and But at the same time, I'm thinking, how many guys out there can carry an entire biography and have it not be swallowed whole by steroid allegations? Mm-hmm. So baseball really has a lot of work to do in terms of 
what to do with that time period. And Ricky was one of the few guys that I felt I could get into subjects and then not have the book turn into a drug controversy. Don't you love the way that the atmosphere of a real live baseball game inside that stadium plays out? I mean, you've got your baseball card fans, you've got your hardcore fans, you've got your families, you've got those that are just searching for some entertainment, but yet there's just, there's a story in those stands from everywhere. One of the things I love most about baseball is it's I think it's, I really do believe it's one of the reasons why I love westerns as well. Baseball and westerns are very very similar <laughs> to me in that nothing happens until something happens. Mm-hmm. Like you'll watch a, a western and it's like okay all right, how long is this desert? <laughs> they just go across. How far? When is something going to... And then all of a sudden, you know, the saloon gets shot up and, every, you know, and all of a sudden there's action. No different than baseball. You sort of stand around on the base paths and, you know, as I always say with baseball, it's the only sport where you can eat and play at the same time. There's guys out there eating sunflower seeds yeah. while the game is going on. And then suddenly something happens and now you've got to react and you've got to know where to throw the ball and you can't panic and you, you throw to the wrong base and you get released. I mean, you're supposed to... You've got to be suddenly on. And that's the thing that I loved most about with Ricky was that there was nothing happening. And then Ricky's on base and now all of a sudden everybody in the yep. world knows something's going to happen. Yep. And you're waiting for something to happen. And that's one of the things that we don't have today, that this piece of the game does not exist anymore. Hey, Ricky, people ask me all the time, what's Ricky's legacy? And I'm not sure he has one anymore. He used to have one because the Kenny Loftons of the game came oh in God. after Ricky. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, the, those base dealers and the Vince Coleman's and those guys were there and they did it because of Ricky. But today, Ricky's a unicorn. They mm-hmm. don't steal bases. I said to Billy Bean, I said, well, what kind of player would Ricky be today? And he says, oh, he'd be Mike Trout. We would, <laughs> you know, he has enough power that we would emphasize his power. We would de-emphasize his speed, even though he has it. But he would be a combination of of Mike Trout. He probably would be a three-hitter. And I'm thinking to myself, and then Billy also said, and by the way, you couldn't pay him enough because of the advanced metrics. The, The stats that we use, he's that valuable. But I walked away from that going, a Ricky Henderson who has power, who's a three hitter, but doesn't steal bases, is not quite Ricky Henderson. <laughs> right. That's not the guy that that we all grew up and watched. And the the skill sets are still there, but if you're not going to let him run wild on the bases. That's not quite the same guy. Oh, my God. That it reminds me of when I went to Wrigley Field. I was there to see Sammy Sosa hit home runs. I, you know, I catch the ball. That's cool. I want a home run, Sammy. And Sammy Sosa is one of my favorite steroid era statistics. <laughs> yeah. he, he, he really is. Sammy Sosa in 1995 went 30-30. 30 home runs, 30 stolen bases. Right? In 2001, he went 64-0. Mm. Mm. Oh my God! And that now that right there, I I did not know that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so so what? Because he became too heavy because of the steroids? Because he he became no, steal, he's not going to steal bases anymore. He's a slugger. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah, they completely de-emphasized some of the things. And Sammy Sosa was an electric five-tool player. And Sammy yeah. Sosa was not only an electric five-tool player, but Sammy Sosa in 1989 when he came up with the White Sox. Um, before he got, yeah, the White Sox and then the Texas Rangers or the Rangers and then the White Sox, yeah. whichever it was. Um, the sporting news was calling him the next Ricky Henderson. Uh, yep, yep. I remember the stolen bases because he had speed. And that's, you know, that, that was the thing that I loved about him being out there in the field as well. Yeah, 100%. And so it's just, I think that for me, it was just so much fun to dig into a subject that people want to talk about. Everybody has something to say about Ricky. Everybody remembers Ricky. And the people that didn't see him play had heard about him. So now you can find out if if all the Ricky stories are true. Which ones are true, which ones are not. When the legend becomes (laughs) fact, print the legend. And so it was really something enjoyable for me to do along these lines for, for, for that reason. I mean, and also just the fact, as I've said over and over again, for all the Ricky stories and for all the wacky hijinks and the fact that, <laughs> yes, Ricky took a million dollar check and framed it on his wall before he cashed it. That is a true story. Yes, he actually Jeez. did that. For all of those stories, Ricky also obliterated the record book. Yes, he did say when he joined the Yankees, from my apartment, you can see the entire state building. Um, (laughs) But he also, in 1985, had one of the most amazing seasons anybody's ever had. He, he, He scored 146 runs in 143 games 
incredible. Wow. You got to come back to this show anytime in the future. I love where your heart is. I believe that you are, you, you're an archaeologist as well as a teacher of the game of baseball. Give a call anytime. I'm happy to join you. Thank Absolutely. you for Absolutely. Will you be brilliant today, okay, sir? <laughs> Thank you.